welcome to another episode of Data Journeys. This is where you come to learn from data and analytics leaders who have achieved amazing growth, amazing results. And today I'm excited for you to meet Aaron. Aaron is from Postmates, has been there for almost six years, and he's learned a ton from the way the business has grown as well as from the way they've used the data. So he's going to tell us a little bit about his secrets. Aaron, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. In case people don't know, tell us first, what is Postmates? Yeah, of course. Great to be here. Thanks. So Postmates is an on-demand delivery platform. Uh, it's recently become a part of the Uber family. Uh, so from a data and analytics perspective, all the deliveries that happen on Postmates uh, happen in what's kind of called a three-sided marketplace. So every delivery has a customer, a courier, a merchant. So then all of our analytics is also going to be three times as complex. So we've had to approach data analytics at Postmates in kind of a flexible way because things are changing so quickly. And like you said, because of the growth, we've had to react to that internally, which is a good problem to have, but it's a problem nonetheless. So your team has a big job to accomplish. You've got a thousand employees, you've got 40 product analysts, you only have an engineering team of about six people. So talk to us about the use cases that you drive and, and the amazing service that you're driving to the rest of the organization. I don't think this is unique for us. I've heard a lot of other companies mention that kind of inverse pyramid model where you have you know, a broad company, tons and tons of data, big analytics org, and just this tiny little group of people that are maintaining the data pipelines and, and keeping everything afloat. So we have that same experience. And the way that we've accomplished that is by kind of getting out of the way. So we understand that you know our analytics team is full of really intelligent people who are doing their best to produce interesting analyses from the data that we have available. So if we can get it to them in a reasonable way, in a reasonable time frame, they can kind of take it from there. So we maintain an Airflow instance internally that runs about 200 or more data pipelines uh, and transformation pipelines that all feeds into our data warehouse in Google BigQuery. And that is heavily contributed to by our analytics and engineering machine learning data science groups at the company. They use that to maintain their data pipelines and the data engineering team supports the infrastructure itself that keeps things running. And we're able to support this kind of organization by not being a single point of failure, by not being that kind of bottleneck to progress. We keep the data flowing, we keep the infrastructure running, and everybody else can kind of do what they need to do to get their work done without us having to get in the way. So you have, you said, 200 data pipelines. You've got 35 or so uh, external and internal data source and database coming yep. into the mix as well, and over 650 event streams running through mm -hmm. Kafka. So tell us a little bit more about the type of analysis that's enabled and, and how you think about your data pipelines. Are you, are you staging this in the data lake? Are you using BigQuery as your data lake? How do you think about your architecture? We use BigQuery as our data lakes. This is one of the things that we really like about the product is that it allows us to avoid that kind of extra layer of complexity by having to store the raw data in a separate place and then query externally. So we keep all of our raw data for the most part that we just bring in from our internal databases, primary data sources from within the company that powers all of our applications and microservices to all of the external data sources and you know third party vendors that we use across you know sales and customer support and marketing and that kind of stuff. All of that gets pulled into this primary project that we run in BigQuery and for the for the most part, everyone kind of gets read access to that by default. So one of the things that's been really great about doing this in the Google infrastructure is we don't have to maintain a separate authentication flow. If you're a part of the Postmates organization, which is done through G Suite, you get access to your data. We can give access to data through Google Groups. So it's all hands off. Everything happens automatically. So when someone joins the company, they can get in right away and start digging around the data and exploring things. To make it easier for folks to get started, we have a separate project that has all of our kind of primary reporting tables and data sets that lives there. Some of those are maintained by the core data engineering team, and some of those are maintained by the various teams. At the end of the day, there's far too much in a company like Postmates for any one person or one group of people to keep track of. So again, we've kind of used that model of providing the infrastructure and allowing 
those who have the closest kind of institutional knowledge of their product area to build data sets that can be used and seen by everyone else. So we put some kind of lightweight processes in there as well, of just validation and, and, and testing. And, you know, we use the kind of self-describing tables with column descriptions and table definitions. So again, it's easy to kind of come in, whether you're brand new or you've been here for five years and you're exploring a new area, you can see kind of what people are querying from and what they're using. So yeah, it's nice having everything there in one place. This is quite amazing. So you've built a system that not only is bringing in a lot of data, but is accessible to a lot more people as your company is growing and it's all integrated. It's kind of the secure self-service system you've created. Yeah. Now, uh, across these six years you've been there, you've learned a lot about what people should do and people should not do. Uh, yeah. Share with us some of your, maybe let's start with the positive. So share yeah. with us some of your best practices. I would say, you know, nothing here is going to be rocket science. This is all basic stuff. But when you're in the mix day to day, it can be easy things to forget. So the biggest one that I have seen play out time and time again is that communication is the most important thing. Having a unified vision of what you're trying to accomplish and making sure individuals understand that smart people given, you know, not very many tools to work with, they'll MacGyver their way to a solution. So if you aren't communicating about where to go and what to do, folks will tend to kind of reinvent the wheel unintentionally. So communicating not only externally, but allowing channels for folks to communicate with you about what they need and doing those kind of, you know, listening tours in a sense, uh, whether it's office hours or, you know, one-on-one -on -one with analytics leads and engineering leads around the company, that's the easiest way to stay in tune with how you're doing it. So one of the things that we've done recently that I wish we would have done sooner, we've gone to a distributed data engineering model. So we've split our six person team in half. We have three people who are on kind of core data engineering and three that have embedded out into product teams across the company. So they are right there, you know, close up with the products and features that are being shipped and, you know, the applications that are producing and consuming data. So they can not only advise those teams, hey, here's what's available and how to use it, but they can come back and advise the core team, hey, here's what's needed. Here's what we should be building. Here's some use cases that we could really solve and unlock, you know, potential. So that's that's been huge. And that all kind of goes back into that communication side. The other two pieces I would say, you know, are flexibility. Don't lock yourself into a solution where you can't get out of it. Needs will change things will scale and migrations are very expensive, both technically and from an organizational perspective. And the final one I would say is just start small and prove it out. You need to have a test case, no matter how great your solution is in your head, it may not meet the demands of what your users are trying to get out of it, right? So all of those play together, I think kind of having a healthy feedback loop, both for yourselves and for your users goes a long way. I like how you have your your both distributed and embedded data engineering teams and you split them right in, in the middle. Yep. There's also uh, one thing you, you told me about earlier is this idea that your data engineers actually used to be data analysts. So you've been that's able true. to mature them into that profession. You know, would you think that's a best practice? And, and if so, what did you do? Did you get them into training? How, how, how would an organization do that? Take an analyst and then help them become a data engineer. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, so I found this to be the case when I've been, you know, working in a recruiting capacity. Someone can be mm -hmm. called a data engineer, and depending on the company that they're coming from, they may be a data engineer because they're the one person at their company who happens to write some Python. So like they've done it all, right? They they keep swapping hats between being an analyst and you know writing some code and that kind of thing. So that was sort of what happened for us, right? Postmates grew very organically in a business sense. And we did the same thing internally. I used to be an analyst at Postmates. I think everybody on my team, for those who moved into data engineering and those who we hired into data engineering, were all analysts at some point. This is not the only way to do it. There are certainly cons to having a uniform group of talent, right? In any particular team, variety always, always comes with some, um, some benefits. But I would say one of the biggest things that's been valuable for us is understanding what it looks like to use data and how that process feels when you have what you need and when you don't have what you need. It also gains you a lot of credibility with the customers, the internal customers that, that we're working with. 
because they know that we've been in their shoes. And when they say, hey, I'm running into this issue with this query and you know whatever it is, we know SQL and we can fix it for them. We can help them out with it. And we can kind of hear what their feedback is, I think, in, in, you know, in a more specific way. So that's been huge. Grow, I mean, growing a team like that, growing an analyst into an engineer, the biggest challenge is getting them to stop thinking like an analyst and start thinking like an engineer that may seem to contradict what I just said, but an engineering problem is very different than an analytics problem. You know, putting How folks- How do you teach them how to do that? Do, do you have the Postmate did engineering school or is it something that you learn by <laughs> yeah, how you guys I, work together? It's the school of hard knocks, right? You you learn by you learn by doing. So one thing that I will say that's been really valuable is, you know, everybody at Postmates has been really, really open to sharing knowledge. We don't really operate in silos. I mean, this is a comment for just the broad engineering org at Postmates and, and uh, the leadership there is that it's a very open environment to say, hey, I'm trying to do this thing and I don't know how to do that. Can I look over your shoulder? Can you help me out? So somebody who is who has been an engineer for, you know, two weeks can go to one of our core infrastructure tech leads who's been, you know, writing bash scripts and Perl scripts for 15 years and they can sit down together and code out a problem together and that is invaluable to kind of expanding the worldview of someone who's trying to become an engineer yeah I, I mean putting two people together in a room and having them kind of talk through an idea is, is is always a beneficial thing and I think it's true too when you're trying to grow somebody regardless of their starting point and kind of the ending goal so pairing people. So we, we've talked a good bunch about best practices. Let's now flip that and let's talk about what people should avoid. People, you know, things you would have told people or told yourself mm -hmm. when you started to not go out and do. What would those things be? I mean, I think the world of data is a little bit different here from, you know, just a purely uh, product engineering universe in that this, everything is gray area. There's no real single source of truth when it comes to data. I remember, you know, years ago, someone would say, hey, how many deliveries did we do yesterday? I'd be like, okay, what do you mean by delivery? What do you mean by yesterday? <laughs> because I can change. <laughs> like, do you mean complete? Do you mean to include other things? Do you mean UTC or a local time zone? Or is it all in Pacific time? You know, all of that can change. All of those answers are correct but none of them will be the same. So you'll run into issues if you aren't understanding exactly what problem you're trying to solve. So that plays out again Being and again. precise about the context. Yeah, exactly. So a lot of these are gonna be the opposite of what the, of what the best practices are, right? If communication is key, mm -hmm. working in, the, in a vacuum or working in your own head or working on a project alone is gonna be the easiest way to reach failure at a massive scale. So don't release the thing that you're trying to do before it's actually ready, before it's actually vetted. You know, we've run a couple of migrations internally at Postmates. At one point we moved our entire data warehouse, our entire reporting pipelines and all of that. And we ran into some issues where we tried to get feedback from someone on a product, data product that just wasn't ready to be released yet. So all of the feedback was just, I don't know how to query this, or this table doesn't have anything in it, you know, that kind of stuff, which just isn't useful. Now you're wasting everybody's time. So the easiest way to gain credibility is time. The only way to gain credibility is time when it comes to data. The easiest way to lose credibility is by having some silent issue kind of creep in that then you realize what you've been working on this whole time has been wrong by just the some some degree so making sure that you've vetted what you're doing not just within your own team from a technical perspective but with your end users that's going to set you up for, for success and the final thing i would say is just don't be clever people have thought of all the smart stuff that's out there when you're building data pipelines keep it simple it's very rare mm -hmm. that you will need to go out and invent something new as a solution to accomplish something that's relatively simple. Now, data is complex enough on its own and getting useful data that's self-documenting, that's easy to validate, that's widely used and respected, there's enough hurdles to jump over right there. And trying to come up with, you know, clever technical solutions to produce some of that is just, you know, one, one hurdle too many. That's excellent. Aaron, thank you so much for spending the time with us today. You have taught us a lot. There's at least two that I'm taking away this idea of distributed and centralized data engineering and the way you're maturing internal data analysts to become data engineers. I think that's really pretty exceptional and, and for 
uh, the speed at which you guys grow uh, is really quite uh, unique. And then finally, uh, this last comment here on don't be clever, keep things simple, I think is very useful to our community. I hope you also uh, find that you got a lot of value out of this. Of course, we want you to make sure you connect with Aaron. But also, if you want to see more episodes like this one, be sure to click on the link down below for more great stories from great customers. Aaron, thank you so much for your time. We'll see you soon.